Abundant Life Church family and everybody else who's watching tonight, uh, welcome to our Wednesday night healing service. I guess it's healing school, uh, but it is a healing service, and we're so glad that you could tune in tonight. And not only are we glad, but we know that it's beneficial for you. So it's really important that you get your Bible out tonight and get your tablets, your pen and paper, whatever it is that you have to take notes with. You know, many of you know, if you've been coming to our church, that I am an avid note taker. And taking notes is a good habit because then you have something where you can go back and you can look later at the things that were important to you or stood out to you during the message. And you know what happens, um, the Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And if we're not careful, we hear it one time in a service, but then we forget about it. You know, it's like that scripture in James that talks about how when we look into the Word of God, it's like looking into a mirror. We see who we really are when we're looking into it, but then we walk away and we forget what manner of man we are. And so I just encourage you, I guess all that said, this is your admonition for take some notes. Even if you just write one thing down that really stands out to you, that could be making a big difference in your life. And it's part of meditation. But anyway, let's open up in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that this is healing school and that you have a plan and a purpose for this night. And Father, we know there are many that will be watching, whether live or later on, as this is archived, that have need of healing in their bodies. And Father God, we can say with confidence that multitudes of people could use healing and better health just by virtue of the fact that there are multi-billion dollar industries all dedicated to medicine and health. And Father, we know that you are the best healer. Your word is the best medicine. And so we thank you, Lord, that your word will go forth tonight with the anointing of God upon it, and it will heal, and it will change lives. And we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. We just want to start out tonight with a few announcements for you. Um, uh, remember, everybody, let us know you're watching, uh, especially our church family. Uh, if you're coming in person, we can see your face. But since we can't see your face, we'd like to see your name. So please let us know, hey, I'm watching, I'm here. Uh, also, we want to remind you all that we're going to have another Friday night roundtable live at 7 p.m. And this time we are going to have Tim and Elizabeth, my uh, daughter and son, and uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be edifying. And so we encourage you to tune into that. You know, it is more worthwhile to watch the 7 o'clock live stream that we're putting out than it is to watch a movie that Hollywood produces. Uh, you know, the Hollywood production will um, stimulate and entertain your flesh and your senses, maybe your mind. But it's not going to do a thing for your spirit. And so we encourage you to tune in and watch that. And it'll be edifying for you. Also want to remind everybody that Richard Roberts is still coming, but it's not going to be in the month of May. It will be August 16th through the 19th. I think that's a nine. Let me see. Yep, 16th through the 19th. So mark your calendars. You don't want to miss those services. And uh, also the book of the month is I Believe in Visions by Kenneth Hagen. We know we had it recently, sometime in the last year, but we know that all of you have that book. And I just want to put in a plug for that book because I know for me personally, every time I put, pick up that book to read it, I feel like I'm instantly transported into the spirit realm. And that is such a good book to pull you out of the natural realm and into the realm of the spirit, to just be tuned in to what God is saying and what God is doing. And so I encourage you, uh, read the book. If you need it and you don't have a copy, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can also get it at rhema.org. It just might take quite a bit longer to get. So wanted to let you know about that. Also, this Sunday, uh, be praying for no rain. Because if it is raining, then we will not be able to have a drive-in service. And uh, we will let everybody know by Sunday morning. So uh, just keep aware of that, that if you show up in the rain, you might be the only one in the parking lot. But last time I made that announcement, the weather changed, so... Hopefully that's going to happen. All right, we're going to go ahead and turn in our Bibles tonight to the book of Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. 
Now, this is the Apostle Paul talking, and clearly he had times of distress because he's commending them and saying, you have done well in that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, I want to point out here that Paul's not just talking about giving. He's talking about giving and receiving. And it's not a complete message if a preacher is only saying give, 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 give. Because the reciprocal is just as powerful. It's a ministry of giving and receiving. And that's really what this chapter is about. It's not Paul trying to get more money from the Philippian church. This is Paul thanking them for what they did. This is Paul commending them. And it's also Paul praying for the increase to come upon their lives because of it. So he goes on to say, For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And I can say with all sincerity that Pastor Jeff and I and all the staff of our church, we are seeking the fruit that abounds to your account more than we're seeking the gift. You know, certainly it takes finances to run a church. It takes money to run anything in life. It takes money to run your household. It takes money to run a business. I mean, really, the whole world system revolves around money. So we do need money on this earth, but it's not our God. And so that's the difference between the church and the world. And in our case, yes, we receive offerings. We receive tithes. We're not doing it just to pay bills, though. God has a deeper and a higher purpose. And his deeper and higher purpose is that you have a spiritual avenue open. It's an avenue of trust where you're trusting God with all your heart. And he is looking for a way to get blessing and increase back into your life. Or if you never had it, into your life to begin with. And his spiritual system for doing that is through giving and receiving. And so we have an opportunity every time we come together as a church to be givers, to be tithers, and to watch God reciprocate what we do in an abundant measure. Now, of course, this only works as you believe it. You know, God doesn't just operate uh, with your doubt and unbelief. You have to believe it in your heart. You have to be in agreement with it, with the words of your mouth. But God wants you to give so you can receive. And it says here, Indeed, I have all, and I abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You know, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, many of the sacrifices they brought to the temple were animals that were to be burnt as a sacrifice to God. Now, of course, they, they also brought gold and silver and uh, tangible things that were not burned up. But when God would smell the incense of those sacrifices, it was a sweet-smelling sacrifice to him. He was pleased by it. Not because he likes the smell of burnt animals, but because it represented their heart, their sacrifice, their gift. And so Paul is saying, hey, your gift is a, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we are going to take this opportunity right now to receive our tithes and offerings for the church. Uh, we want to let you know that we still have ongoing projects, and so if you uh, would be feel led to give towards any of those projects, it would be a huge blessing. Uh, we're still working on the interior of the building, and of course we have a new roof that eventually needs to be put on in the near future. So uh, across the screen, uh, there should be posted some lines for how you can give. You can give at our website at AbundantLifeFamily.Church, uh, clicking the Give bar. You can give by texting to give, and you can certainly mail your tithes and offerings to the church P.O. Box. So uh, we wanted to just give you that opportunity, and thank you so much for supporting this church family. Uh, it is not going unnoticed, and God is definitely pleased by your sacrifices. So, Father, we thank you tonight for every person who's giving in this offering. Lord, we thank you that they're not just giving, but they are receiving. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of giving and receiving. Lord, we know that you sowed your only begotten son, Jesus, so that you could reap a harvest 
of millions and millions of sons and daughters. And we know that a seed sown always produces if it's done with the spirit of faith. So we thank you, Lord God, for the increase that's coming to your people because of their obedience and their faithfulness and their sacrifices. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, tonight we've got some things to take care of. Uh, first of all, you should have gotten the notice that we're going to receive communion. And so if you need to take this opportunity to make sure you get uh, a cracker, a piece of bread, whatever you have in your house, and if you have some juice, if you don't, you can use water, but you want to be ready towards the end of tonight's service to receive communion. So make sure you get that ready by the time we get to that part of the service. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about our twofold redemption. And something Brother Hagen said that really stands out to me, I've, I've heard him say it so many times because I listened to so many of his messages, but he said that uh, he would go for as many as six or seven years and not even know he had a body. You say, well, how can a person not know they have a body? Well, what he meant was he could go for as long as six or seven entire years without any pain, without any kind of symptoms of sickness or disease, nothing going wrong with his body. And every time I hear that statement, I think, glory to God, what a way to live. Now, the thing that we have to do is we have to qualify why that worked for him. I mean, this is the same man that said he never had a headache since 1933. And as far as I know, he never did up until the day he went to heaven at the age of 86. So that's quite a testimony, and I know of very few people that have that testimony. But like we've said before, we shoot for the highest and the best. And so uh, the thing, though, that we have to remember is the reason why he could go for six or seven years and not know he had a body. And that's because he said he never, ever let one day go by where he didn't feed his spirit along the lines of faith and healing. Every single day. He said he would travel, of course, and minister in churches, and sometimes he'd be gone for as many as eight or nine weeks at a time. And he said he never let his head hit the pillow at night until he had read something along the lines of faith and healing. Now that is instruction for us. That's something that if we want to live in health, if we want to receive healing and then live in health, we need to heed that instruction that this is something we don't play games with, that we don't take lightly, but we're serious about the Word of God. Now, uh, you know, he in his day, of course, when he traveled, they didn't really have television. I know they didn't have computers. Or weren't they fortunate? <laughs> and what do I mean by that? Technology can be a blessing and it can be a huge frustration. Uh, but he didn't have a lot that could distract him in the evenings, and so he would fellowship with the pastor but maybe listen to the news, you know, for 15 minutes on a radio. But then he would make sure he was reading books and reading his Bible and always feeding his faith along the lines of healing. And so when we have healing school every week, you're just getting really a small dose. Uh, that's why you have to feed yourself every day. But tonight we're going to talk about our twofold redemption. So... Uh, if we desire to receive healing and live in health, we have to feed along these lines. Now let's look at the word redemption. The word redemption actually means to buy back. It means to free from what distresses or harms, or to free from captivity by payment of ransom. Oh, glory to God. Here's another definition. To release from blame or debt. To free from the consequences of sin. So if we look at this, this is what Jesus did for us. He bought us back. He freed us from what distresses or harms us. He freed us from captivity by payment of ransom. He paid the price. He, no, we could not pay the debt. I think it was a few weeks ago when I talked about healing and forgiveness, and we looked at the story of the man that owed, you know, well, they tried to go by today's standards, but basically billions of dollars. And there was no way possible he could repay that debt. And that master forgave him of all of it. You know, you and I had a debt that we could never repay. We could never pay for our sins. But Jesus could, and thank God he did. It, it says that Jesus released us from blame. You know the blame game? 
A lot of times people want to blame God for their problems in life. But you know what? Another thing that humans are guilty of is blaming themselves for everything. Well, Jesus paid the price from the blame. Glory to God. Don't you let the devil cause you to take the blame for things that you're not responsible for anymore. You know, as far as God's concerned, you're released from your debts. You're released from your sins. But thank God this last part here, Jesus freed us from the consequences of sin. Now we're going to look at what are the consequences of sin, because if you don't know that, then you don't fully understand what you've been redeemed from. So what we find out, a lot of the consequences of sin are listed in Deuteronomy 28, really the last three-fourths of the chapter. And We're not going to go there and read all of that tonight, but let me just categorize some of those things that we've been redeemed from. The consequences of sin in this life could be distress, could be anxiety and depression, poverty and lack, sickness and disease, or broken relationships. I'll tell you what, that covers a whole lot. These are the consequences of sin in one's life. But the good news is Jesus freed us from all of these consequences. So therefore, according to God's perspective, we are free from distress, we're free from anxiety, we're free from depression, we are free from poverty and lack, we're free from sickness and disease, we're free from broken relationships harming us or hurting us. And you say, wow, that sounds great, but um, I'm a Christian and I have some of these things in my life. Well, the thing that I'm here to tell you tonight is they don't have to stay. Because from God's perspective, the price has been paid. The debt's been paid. I've heard it said this way before, that you could be a prisoner inside of a prison cell. And Jesus comes along and he unlocks the prison door and opens it and says, you're free. Well, he opened the way for you to step out of that prison. But if you just stand there and linger in that cell, there's nothing more he can do for you. He's not going to grab you by the hand, the leg, the hair, and, and pull you out. You have to walk out of it. And the way that we do that is by our faith. Amen. Now, if you study uh, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis... Or if you study the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, you see a common thread of the real uh, original intention and plan of God for mankind. We see that God's original plan did not include any of those consequences of sin. Because certainly it did not include sin. You know, Adam and Eve, they were the only humans that came to a planet. They were, they were created and formed here and placed here by God himself. But they were the only ones that ever enjoyed this planet in its original state without the consequences of sin upon it. And, of course, we all know what happened. They sinned against God. The curse came upon the earth. Satan became the god of this world system. And everything went downhill after that. So they left a perfectly wonderful plan to uh, follow a different god, which is really not much of a god at all. And I want you to know tonight you do not want to serve the devil. Now, here's the thing about that statement. A lot of people think, well, I'm not serving the devil. Well, whether you know it or not, if you're not serving God, if you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, by default, you're serving the devil. And uh, that's not a real pretty thought, but he has a way through his conniving and deceitfulness to control more of you, your life than you would really fully understand or believe he's controlling. He's subtle, you know, like, like the serpent that came in the garden. He, by cunning craftiness, he deceived Eve. And he'll deceive you too, and you won't even realize it's the devil doing it. He'll try to get off scot-free. So we're either serving God or we're serving the devil. Well, serving Jesus is so much better. And, um, and so because of Adam and Eve's fall, and the consequence of that fall was sin coming upon all of mankind, and, of course, on the wings of sin came all of those consequences that I listed. But praise God, we're redeemed from it. And we're going to look at some scriptures that show us that we've been redeemed. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 4 and 5. And this is a, a classic Old Testament. Really, it was prophecy because Isaiah was a prophet. This is before the Messiah came. 
but he prophesied about Jesus here and about the work that he would do. Now, in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Now, let's just go back from it to verse 4. We know that the Hebrew scholars that translated that verse, they translated it griefs and sorrows, but the original language should have been translated as sicknesses and pains. So we could say this, Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. In other words, he didn't do it for himself because Jesus had no sin. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I love that. We are healed. So Isaiah's prophesying here, but he's not saying we are going to be healed. He says by his stripes we are healed. I love that present tense. You know, if it's not now, it's not faith. Because faith is always present tense. So, some have thought that this is referring to spiritual healing, and we know that that's not true. Let's go over to the New Testament now, to the book of Matthew. And we see in the book of Matthew that they quote what we just read in Isaiah. And it is in reference to physical healing. So this disproves the idea that Isaiah 53 is only talking about spiritual healing, which really your spirit doesn't need to be healed anyway. It needs to be completely changed. Uh, but in Matthew chapter 8, there are one instance after another of Jesus healing. He healed a leper. He healed a centurion's servant. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then in verse 16, it says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. I love that verse, too. You know, if, if he could cast out the spirits with his word, you can get rid of the devil with God's word, too. And it says, He healed all who were sick. And look at verse 17, That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, which is what we just read, Isaiah 53, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So in other words, he healed all of these people. He healed all who were sick in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Hey, praise God, Isaiah was prophesying about Jesus who was to come, the Messiah, and that he would heal of diseases. Now let's go to another scripture uh, that also quotes part of Isaiah, and that's 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. In 1 Peter and chapter 2 and verse 24, it says, Who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree? Now that was our sins that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Peter here is talking to believers. He's talking to believers in Jesus Christ who are born again. He's saying, you have died to sin. Now you should live for righteousness. And it goes on to say, by whose stripes you were healed. So it's interesting, in Isaiah it says, by his stripes we are healed. And now Peter, quoting Isaiah's prophecy, says, By his stripes you were healed. So Peter also validates the fact that Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus, and it's talking about uh, forgiveness of sins and healing of our bodies. So we see what we call our twofold redemption in these passages. Redeemed from sin and redeemed from sickness and disease. It's a package deal. And most of the church world, they're, they're so well-versed in being forgiven of their sins. Uh, none of us would deny the fact that Jesus died for our sins, but so many people have a hard time believing that he actually paid the price for sickness and disease. Um, maybe it's just the idea that I know I sin, I ask God to forgive me, I believe he forgives me, but it doesn't really require a feeling. 
But when it comes to sickness and disease, we know whether we still have a pain in our body or not. And so I think that that, that causes your mind to go into tilt. You know, you're thinking, well, yeah, I know I'm forgiven, but I still have this pain in my body, so how can I believe I'm healed if I have pain in my body? Well, we know from Mark chapter 11 that you have to believe you receive your healing first, then you will have it. So the things of God, they, they operate so different from the world system that when we become a born-again believer, we have to relearn how to live life. I mean, it's a whole new way of living. We have to learn all over again what's right, what's wrong, how to live, how to approach God, how to pray, how do we believe Him for things. Well, we know this, that faith is what moves God, but faith works by believing before it sees anything. And, and to some degree, you know, we believe we're forgiven of our sins, but we have not seen our full redemption as far as we're not in heaven right now. Now, spiritually speaking, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ, but we are not physically located there at this moment. And so it's a, it's a faith proposition. We believe we'll be there one day soon enough, and maybe sooner than you think. Uh, and I don't mean because you're going to die anytime soon, but I believe Jesus is coming soon. And that's something we're going to see more and more preached as the day approaches. But Peter here, he is saying, who himself bore our sins in his own body, that we having died to sins might live unto righteousness. And I like to say this when I'm quoting this verse. And... I've also died to sickness and disease. In the same way I've died to sin, I've died to sickness and disease. By his stripes I was healed. Do you know, every one of our sins were nailed to the cross when Jesus died. And every one of our sicknesses and diseases were nailed to the cross. And so really, uh, we're free. We're redeemed. What did we read the definition of redeemed was? Uh, we're free from it. We're bought and paid from it. Uh, Jesus freed us from the consequence of it. He released us from the debt. Sickness and disease doesn't belong to us any more than sin belongs to us. But we have to be reminded of these things because so often uh, symptoms of disease try to come on our bodies and we have to make a decision. Are we going to stand on the word or are we going to cave to the circumstances? Now here's another scripture that lets us know that forgiveness and healing go hand in hand. In Psalm 103, Verses 2 and 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not one of all his benefits. Oh, glory to God, he daily loads us with his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Listen, I'd be happy if it was some, but it's all. We don't have to settle for just some. Now, the Amplified says it this way, who forgives every one of all your iniquities, who heals each one of all your diseases. That's a good translation. So, no matter what you've got going on in your body today, according to this word, he heals each one of all. It could be an ingrown toenail. If you believe God, he would completely remove it. Uh, it could be uh, dandruff. I mean, I'm naming things that are seemingly minor right now because these are the kinds of things that most people just live with and ignore and don't ever use their faith for. But listen, if you'll practice on the simple things, you can develop your faith for when the bigger things try to come along. He heals each one of all your diseases. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to the book of Matthew again and let's go to chapter 9. The book of Matthew, chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 2. Matthew, chapter 9, and verse 2, it says, Then, behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now, we know this. He came to his own city, and now he is in, many believe he was in his own house. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Now there are other translations uh, that show us that they actually had to lower this man through the roof. And that's a whole other teaching. But think about it, if you're a paralytic and you're on some kind of a makeshift bed, I mean they didn't have the kind of equipment we have today, 
and you can't get to Jesus because the place is crowded, but your four crazy friends are willing to climb up to the roof with you and remove the tiles and lower you right in front of Jesus. That's exhibiting faith. That's why it says here, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. Why would you t tell a paralytic who's gone to all this trouble to be lowered into your presence, your sins are forgiven you? I mean, that paralytic came to be healed. And if you read throughout the Gospels, you find that the people didn't come to get forgiven. Because a lot of times, maybe they didn't even know that's what they really needed. But Jesus knew that's the root of the problem. You know, if, if sickness and disease is a problem, sin is the root of it. And if the root's been dealt with, it's just like if you don't want dandelions in your yard, you got to deal with the root. If you just rip the top off, it's going to come back. It's going to keep popping up with new dandelions and get thicker and uglier. Although some people think they're pretty. But anyway, the root's been dealt with. So Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. Because he knew that was the real root of the problem. Verse 3, and at once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house, now the multitude saw it, and they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. Now remember, Jesus, of course, is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. And so he's operating as a man anointed by the Spirit of God, and he's bringing a new message to the people of his day. And that message is that you don't have to have your sins held against you anymore. Uh, I mean, he came to be the sacrifice for their sin. And what he's saying to this paralytic is a lesson for all of us, that if your sins are forgiven you, you can be healed. I love it. He says, which is easier to say? It's no more difficult for you to receive healing than it is to receive forgiveness of your sins. Always remember that. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, in my case, I'll just use myself as an example, I've never had difficulty receiving forgiveness. I mean, I know what the Word says about it. I believe with all my heart that if I do something I shouldn't do and I go to the Lord and ask Him to forgive me, I believe He forgives me every single time. Yeah, sometimes lingering feelings of guilt or condemnation will you know, creep about and you have to ignore those things and you have to not let them get to you and eventually it goes away. But you believe with your heart that He does forgive you. Well, it's no different with healing. Which is easier to say? Which is easier to receive? Really, receiving healing should not be a difficult thing because we just say, Lord, in the same way that I believe you've forgiven me of my sins, I believe I receive my healing. Oh, thank you, Lord. He's so good. He's taking care of all of it. We don't have to pick and choose. Aren't you glad? And uh, tonight, because it's communion, I thought this was just a good starting point because, you know, we have... Forgiveness of sins and healing included in all of these passages. And of course, we know that's what the communion is all centered around. It's centered around forgiveness of sins and healing of our bodies. Um, let me go ahead. We're going to read something. I have this healing treasury by Lillian Yeomans, which is a treasury, that's for sure. Uh, some of the greatest classic books on healing are contained in here. And... Uh, I'm just going to read a few things in here that are of, of great interest to us. Now, the last few times, uh, well, actually, the last time we received communion, which has been a whole month already, if you can believe that, we talked about Egypt and the Passover lamb, and, of course, we did on Passover in, in April, uh, and then the week before that I taught on the blood. And so this takes us back to Egypt again. But she says in one of her books, uh, in this healing treasury, uh, she said, the firstborn of Israel, as well as those of the Egyptians, were secure only through the blood. When I see the blood, 
This is Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you. Now, the thing that differentiated the Egyptians from the Israelites was the blood. And the thing that separates us from the world is the blood of Jesus. We have applied his blood to our lives, just like Israel applied his blood to their door lintels and the, the doorposts. So the destroyer had to pass on by and could not harm them. Hallelujah. I mean, I'm sure that there were Egyptians in Egypt that as far as good works go, were good people. Not all of them were like the Pharaoh, but they still lost their firstborn sons because they didn't have the blood. You know, you could have good works. You could do nice things for other people, but without the blood of Jesus, it amounts to zero. And that's the point. We have to have the sacrifice of Jesus. It's his redemption. It's his blood that bought our redemption from sin and from sickness and pain. And so she goes on to say, uh, all that the Egyptian physicians could do, and they could do a great deal, was in vain. The history of medicine shows us that they had a most elaborate system of medicine and surgery. In an ancient graveyard dating back to 1500 BC, Skeletons were exhumed on which all sorts of delicate and difficult surgical work had been performed. And from the Evers papyrus, it is evident that the ancient Egyptians prior to and contemporaneous with Moses performed many surgical operations. <clears throat> so we're talking about in the days of Moses. They performed surgical operations, including the removal of tumors and operations on the eye in which department of surgery they were particularly well versed. Skulls had been, uh, on which trephining had been performed had been unearthed dating back as far as 2800 BC. Now it says here, Egyptian surgeons, who were also the priests and undertakers, were so skillful in their manipulation of the dead body that they removed the entire brain through the nasal orifices after death in connection with the process of embalming. I hope none of you have passed out yet. <laughs> you know, in my day, nurses would sit around the lunch table and talk about all kinds of delightful and disgusting things, and nobody passed out, but hold on now, because we're getting somewhere. It says, in this way, they could avoid making the least change in the contour of the face, which might have been occasioned if an incision had been made. So, in other words, she's stating a point here that these Egyptian surgeons had such skills. You know, sometimes we just think, oh, everybody was so primitive thousands of years ago. They were just like the cavemen. <clears throat> well, first of all, we don't know if cavemen were primitive in the sense that they were stupid. That's just what uh, humanism teaches. But it's not what the Bible teaches because man was developed and created by God with terrific intelligence, probably more intelligent back in the early days of mankind than we are today. We had more oxygen getting to our brains back in Adam's day. But anyway, it says, As to medicine, they had an extensive pharmacopoeia, including castor oil and opium. They also used inhalations, potions, snuffs, fumigations, salves, clisters, injections, and poultices. They also seem to have had some quack medicines, or something very like them, for we read of a famous powder called the Powder of the Three Great Men while another bore the title, Powder Recommended by Five Great Physicians. They were enthusiastic about elimination and fasting in the treatment of disease, just as many doctors are today. Do you know there's nothing new under the sun? And they had meat inspected and water boiled if they bought them impure. Yes, the physicians and surgeons of Egypt were doubtlessly capable and clever, but here's the point. But confronted with the deadly plague which slew the firstborn of Egypt, they were as helpless as infants. No doubt a consultation of the best medical men in the empire was hurriedly called by the royal physician, whose business it was to watch over the health of the heir to the throne. But before they could assemble, he had passed forever beyond their reach. A gasp, a gurgle, a convulsive struggle for breath, bulging eyes, a livid hue about the lips, a stiffening of the muscles in the death agony, 
And the lineal descendant of all the pharaohs was as dead as the son of the poor servant behind the mill. Medical science is strictly limited in its possibilities, and the best doctors are the first to confess this. The list of incurable diseases is long, very long, and even in the case of diseases that are classed as curable, the result of treatment is often palliative rather than curative. One of America's foremost physicians, now dead, said, in back of all disease lies a cause which no remedy can reach. The cause we know from the word of God is sin. And for sin and its outworkings in the body is disease, debility, and deformity. And there is but one remedy. And that remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. That's our remedy, folks, his blood. It's interesting, too, and I wanted to read this because we are in the middle of a viral pandemic, which seems to be loosening its grip on our society. But she brought out here that during the epidemic of Spanish influenza, which baffled our modern physicians almost as much as the plague that destroyed the firstborn of Egypt baffled those of ancient Egypt, thousands of God's people were rendered perfectly immune by getting under the shelter of the blood and staying there. When the fell destroyer was literally raging in the town in which we live, now she's talking about the town she lived because Lillian Yeomans was alive during the Spanish influenza and a medical doctor, and we know this was back in around 1918, and uh, today what we know about it is it's basically the same as the swine flu, maybe a slight variation. But she was living back then, and it came to their town that they lived in. And her sister said, by faith in the power of the blood to all with whom she came into contact, here is one house on which you will never see an influenza placard, for the blood is here and God will not see it dishonored. See, in that day, they didn't close everything down necessarily, but if you had it in your house, you had to have some kind of a sign outside saying that you had the Spanish influenza in that household. And she said, you'll never see an influenza placard here. And God made her boast in the Lord good. And though we were freely exposed to the disease, she said, I myself never refusing to minister to the afflicted ones. Our whole family enjoyed perfect immunity from it. It was to the blood then and to the blood alone that the Israelites were indebted for their deliverance. So thank God for the blood. Not only did it protect the Israelites back in the days of Egypt, just before the, the exodus from Egypt, but it worked in 1918 for Lillian Yeomans and her sister and their family during the Spanish influenza. And it will work for us today because the blood changes not. Jesus changes not. It never fails. It's eternally uh, making intercession for us standing in the gap between sin and all of its effects and us. Aren't you glad? Praise the Lord. All right, if you're ready now, we're going to receive communion together tonight. And so get your elements ready, and we are going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And of course, the Apostle Paul, again, with all of his great revelation, is giving us more insight in this chapter about the power of communion. And um, he says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. You know the book, I Believe in Visions, which is our book of the month? That book contains not all but many of the visions that Kennedy Hagen had of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those visions were not just for him, but he received things from the Lord, just like Paul. Paul received this revelation from the Lord. It's been written in this New Testament for our benefit. I just wanted to put another plug in for read your book of the month. So he received this, and then he delivered it to us. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. So we're going to do that right now together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know based on all of the scriptures that we've just read that his body was broken for us. It was brutally beaten for us because he took the punishment that we should have taken so that by his stripes we would be healed. And as we receive this bread, we remember what you did for us, and we believe we receive our healing now. Let's go ahead and receive that. <clears throat> thank you, Lord. We thank you for your healing power right now, penetrating every person who is releasing their faith for this, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. We command your bodies to be healed by the blood and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup in, my new, in the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we are having a memorial service. We're remembering what Jesus did for us. But the greatest news of all is that in a, a regular memorial service for some a loved one that's passed on, they're dead. But Jesus is alive. <laughs> and he is there to watch over his word to perform it. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and we ask in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of any sin in our lives. Lord, we believe according to your word that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, we examine our hearts, and if there is anything that needs to be changed, anything we need to be forgiven of, we thank you for revealing it to us clearly. Lord, we, we choose to get it right tonight. And we believe we receive forgiveness now of all of our sins in the name of Jesus. Let's receive that. Praise the Lord. Well, you had that wonderful opportunity then tonight, not only to receive the word of God into your hearts, but to receive forgiveness of your sins and healing of your bodies. Because what did Jesus say? He said, which is easier to say? Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And so it's not an, an either-or proposition. We have both. And before your head hits the pillow tonight, uh, you can go to sleep knowing that you're forgiven and you are healed. Now hold fast to that which you have. Don't let the devil steal it from you. You are the healed of God. You are forgiven. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. And God has a great plan for your life. Now, if you, I probably should have prayed this prayer before we received communion, but if you're watching tonight, by some chance, you're watching and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. We don't want to close out this um, particular service without first giving you the opportunity to invite him into your heart. It's free of charge to do this. It's actually a free gift that the Lord Jesus himself is wanting to give to you. He won't force you to take it, but he is inviting you to receive this free gift. And what's attached to receiving him is eternal life in heaven. And it, there are many benefits while you're on earth. Frankly, it's such a great deal, I don't know why anybody would pass up this opportunity. But if you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior tonight, pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you now with a humble heart. I acknowledge that I've sinned against you. I've sinned against your ways. I ask you to forgive me now of all my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and to be my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you are the only begotten Son of God, that you died for my sins, that you went to hell in my place. I believe that you were raised from the dead and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. I thank you now for forgiving me of all of my sins and for being my Lord and Savior. And I will serve you the rest of my life in Jesus' name.
Now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, it's the simplest thing you ever did, but you're changed. And we want to hear from you. We want to know that you prayed that prayer for the first time. So please write to us. You can message us on Facebook or, or contact us through our website. But let us know so that we can rejoice with you and send you some free materials that will help you get started in your Christian walk. Well, praise the Lord. We're glad that you all could join us tonight. Don't forget, Friday night we have our 7 p.m. live roundtable, and it's going to be good. Um, continue to pray and seek the Lord because this is the season to be building your, yourself up on your most holy faith and not backsliding. So stay strong, stay committed. We love you, we miss you, and we'll see you next time. God bless you.